What's going on everyone, John Matrix here. So I haven't done the actual math of how long it took me to beat Radon, but it was somewhere between like seven to nine hours of attempts um, with some side things in between here. So instead of just subjecting you guys to me bashing my head against the wall for another seven to nine hours of this fight, I figured I would just edit it down and give you guys the overall highlights. However, if you decide you would like to see the full uh, seven to nine hours of me bash my head against this wall. Let me do them down in the comments and at the end of this playthrough when I've got everything down and uploaded, I will uh, render the full fight in its entirety and upload for you guys to watch. So if that's something that interests you guys, let me know down in the comments. So after numerous attempts against Radon and really honestly not making much progress during phase two, I remembered in the patch notes at one point in time that I'd read for Shadow of the Earth Tree upon its release that they had buffed the effect of Melania's Great Rune, which is essentially, if you've played Bloodborne, the rally system from Bloodborne, where if you take damage, there's a certain time period that you have where if you attack, you can recover some of that health based on the damage you do. So I had gotten the idea of, all right, well, I'm not really making a whole lot of progress. Let me see if getting Melania's Rune will make any kind of difference and kind of attempt to uh, mitigate any kind of damage he does by being able to heal back any kind of, you know, damage that I do with him. So yeah, I decided just to go to the Halleck Tree Warp in there and fight Melania, and honestly, it only took me a handful of tries to, to beat her. And I mean, I, I, I'm for sure being impatient right now. I should have beaten her already several times, but I'm just being impatient because I want to get this over with so I can get back to fucking the actual uh, game that I'm trying to beat. What? Cool. Come on, you know you want to do it. You know you want to do it. You know, I gotta say, going back to the base game content and even fighting Melania here, I felt like Neo in the Matrix after spending already several hours of fighting Radon. The fight seemed much easier than I remember. Granted, I over-leveled for the situation, but uh, definitely it was not as challenging as I was anticipated, as it only took me a handful of tries to beat her. And uh, so we got the Great Rune, uh, got it activated, and then went in and tried some more attempts against Radon, which... To be honest, really didn't make a whole lot of difference. However, it did really give me the idea of essentially turning this fight into more of a DPS race. Uh, beforehand, I was really trying to more of make sure I was learning everything, timing all the dodges properly, and et cetera, et cetera. And honestly, it just felt like that's not the best way of doing this fight. 
Um, so I ended up trying some more things. Eventually I went out and I think at the beginning of the fight, uh, or through at least the majority of the attempts of the fight against Radon, I was at power level 16 from the uh, Scooby-Doo fragments, as I like to call them. Uh, and then I went out and I found as many as I can. I think I was missing two overall. So I ended up fighting the rest of the fight against Radon at uh, Scooby-Doo power level 19. Um, and so that's where I ended up with the rest of the fight against him. Um, eventually, you know, using the Millennia's Rune didn't really seem to make a huge amount of difference in the fight. So really, I just ended up going back to uh, Morgoth's Rune with uh, ad adding as much HP as possible. And like I said, I really just ended up turning the fight into a large DPS race, kind of really ignoring a lot of things, dodging what I had to do, but essentially just doing jump attacks. Um, combined with the fact that I was having, you know, the fight is already difficult enough as it is, but for whatever reason was really having a lot of input issues with the game. And it, it doesn't seem to be necessarily something that was an issue just with me. I've talked with other friends who'd play through it and seen some other streamers who've had the same issues uh, it, for whatever reason. I, I don't know if it's been patched and fixed because I haven't really played through Shadow of the Earth trees since, but there was some kind of issue it seemed with inputs being queued up or whatever. And there were definitely times where I would do a jump attack and my guy would just jump and not attack or, you know, afterwards he would land and then attack. And there would just be some weird fuckery that would happen with input cues, which tilted me even more and made the fight even more uh, frustrating. Um, but eventually, as we'll see here, I uh, yeah just ended up turning into kind of a DPS race. And uh, so I'll, I'll just show you guys uh, the highlights of some of my attempts here and then we'll end up moving on to the conclusion of the playthrough and my afterthoughts. So uh, thanks for watching here, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. And like I said, if you would be interested in seeing the full, you know, seven to nine hours of me bash my head against this wall, let me know down in the comments. And uh, at the end of the playthrough, I will uh, upload the unedited fight and put it on here for you guys. But thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, yeah.
a joke. What a joke. If he didn't do that move, I would have beat him. What a joke. If he didn't do that one move that you can't fucking avoid, you can't do anything about. Thing. Dumb. Again, all I feel is a sigh of relief that it's done. honor our part of the vow what vow I know the red man Freya had mentioned something about a vow but well obviously that's not what Redon wants because Redon's a warrior and he wants to fight purple of light interesting all right. Circle of light which adorned Mikolas' head is the return and divine aspect. It, it has begun to fade into nothingness, slightly boosts intelligence, faith, and arcane, while also boosting the power of Mikolas' light. The circle was the circle was to be the very foundation upon Mikolas' age of compassion would be built, should it have ever come to pass. Hermits of Dawn, Consort of Mikola, Hewn of Skidutri. Power of his namesake can be unlocked by the finger reader, blah blah blah. In their childhood, Mikola saw in Radon a lord, his strength and his kindness that stood in stark contrast with their afflicted, afflicted selves. So Mikola made his heartfelt wish that Radon would one day be his king consort. Uh, that's kind of weird.
but I mean, it's what I said would happen. I got good RNG, and uh, yeah, I was able to eventually just break him enough and kill him. Just what it came down to. I'm just glad it's fucking over, dude. I'm just glad it's over and I can move on with my life now. After eight hours or eight, eight and a half to nine hours, somewhere in there of, of fighting this boss. It's done. Julia's stuff, okay. And Achbane stuff. Furious Blade of, okay, interesting. So I, that is something else that I'm curious about in the DLC is like if you, I guess, do the NPC quest lines like you're supposed to, you not have to fight as many of them earlier on. And I guess would they all potentially be here to summon in this fight? I would also, I guess, if that is the case, that could also be a reason why this, this fight's so fucking stupid. Because they plan around you having so many summons. Uh, incantation of aims back pure blood knight produces the blood flame blade from the side of the hand and then lunges at enemies to cleave through them. Charge to increase the number of slashes. Markedly different from the finesse sword play of the dynast, this is an aggressive last resort of an incantation that give rise to the uh, Onsback's fearsome reputation. Okay. Signature weapon of pure blood Onsback, a viciously keen and slender scythe made from co for combat. The Obsidian Edge relies not upon trickery to fulfill its violent purpose. The skill alone, the wielder can rip and rend through foes, sowing blossoms of red upon the battlefield. Uh, I finessed a uh, evasive skill that creates space to maneuver inputs the uh, dictate direction of the back step follow up with strong attack to perform an advancing upward slash press strong attack again to bring the sword back down. Hans back uh, understood the keeping. So the, his set slightly enhances blood oath and dynastic skills. So I guess any kind of the, the blood flame skills that will get enhanced. Onsback understood that keeping his oath to his old master was not an act of logic, nor would it bear any justice, but it was for these reasons he was unable to let go. Um, uh, but an old fear lurks beneath. But an old fear lurks beneath, together with the cold, unflinching discipline that once honed his blade, now employed to enhance blood oath and dynastic skills. Uh, the silver hair is arranged, blah, blah, blah. The sun is arranged, additionally, countless needles are shown in the exterior extremity for a talismanic effect. Just once the earlier was granted the sweet repose of velvet to sleep, the remainder of his days would be spent attempting to recapture it. A concealed weapon used by Theole, a uh, design generally favored by poison wielders for dark and subtle purposes, like St. Trina, who blossomed in the deep purple garden, a rich poison, is secreted from within, which sends its victims into an eternal sleep. Sleep of more uh, pierces the enemy deeply with a poison coated needle that delivers eternal sleep of the follow up strike lands upon a foe who is already in a state of slumber or eternal sleep. You'll deal, deal significant damage. Okay. I'm curious of a couple things. First off, actually, go back to the round table. Then I want to go down and talk to say Trina again and just see if she has any new dialogue. If anything's changed, I'm curious. Well, let's see what kind of shit we get from this remembrance here. Great sword of black steel wielded by Radon in his youth. A pair of weapons decorated with a lion mane motif. These were in his position immediately before his triumph over the stars, the sword of a lord who does not rely on physical strength and gravity alone. Um, view two great swords with the light of Mikola, then deliver a slashing attack accompanied by columns of light. Additional input allows for up to two follow up attacks. Uh, assume an luminous form and leap forward, deliver a downward slash at speed of light. This attack can be followed up by an additional light attack, a charge to increase power 
with the skill and then blah blah blah. You need 15 inch to do these, huh? 72 face for this. Strength of Mikkel upon his defy deific return wielded as an incantation, and I like so is the pillar of light. Mikkel has sought to accept all that was and would be, but found one that refused to be embraced. No wonder as one god and one king consort all the world need. No wonder as one god and one king consort is all the world needs. Interesting. Do you have any more? Okay, was, oh, we do. We have more stuff here for Radon. Buy all the things. I wonder what's different about this one. My brother will keep his promise. He promised he possesses the wisdom of an allure of a god, and he is the most fierce imperium of all. When Millennia Blade of Mikola let the rot flower blossom in Aeoni, Radon heard a murmur in his ear. Mikola awaits thee, O promised consort. Wow. So he like even used so uh, it seems like Mikola was completely obsessed with Radon. Old Lion uh, said to symbolize Godfrey the first Elden Lord in his East Region Sirash from his younger years, Radon was naturally captivated by the Lord of the Battlefield. But yeah, so So Mikola seemed to be obsessed with Radon seeing his uh, strength and will he wanted him to be his king uh, to help him become a god so that he could bring about his age of, of compassion uh, but Radon refused more than likely because Radon's a warrior and he wants to fight he doesn't want an age of like compassion and I guess what could be considered weakness etc so then I, it seems like what Mikola may have become obsessed with him and even manipulated his sister to go like purposely fight him in order to potentially like like this the whole of everything of Elden Ring like beyond America stuff might have been set up by Mikola to begin with I mean there's a couple of different plots going on here right like there's the whole plot with Ronnie and everything with Godwin but then there's also this plot with Mikola to become a god and uh you know on on's back had said that Moog had actually been used by Mikola and charmed. But like it seems like Mikola's rune, his great rune, or just maybe it's just his natural ability as an Empyrean, he can just charm people into doing whatever he wants. You know? Uh and so you know, I guess potentially the uh, it could be the idea that Radon had been the only person who in his life had ever said no and refused them, so that, you know people always want what they can't have kind of a situation so he became obsessed with it but it also could have just been simply the idea of like it again kind of feels like the guts and griffiths kind of thing you know that that same kind of thing from berserk where like griffiths sees this great warrior with this great strength and wants to you know use him as a tool to accomplish his goals so that he can become you know essentially a noble or even king he wanted his own kingdom you know so griffith that's what eventually he wanted to and then of course at the end he got a chance to become even something greater potentially a god or a demon or whatever it is i don't think it's an actual god i think it's more of a demon they say angel but i think it's actually like really a demon um but anyway so yeah that it, it seems to kind of be playing on that theme you know Mikola sees this great warrior and this great strength this person who could not be beat and help him essentially bring in his age of compassion he'd be able to beat godfrey and radagon and the elden beast and uh take the the elden ring and allow Mikola to ascend to godhood to bring about this age of compassion where you know uh, everyone would essentially be loved equally and get along, but it would all essentially be, you know, uh, kind of a puppeteer thing. Like, no one would really have their own free will, 
Nicola would essentially have them all charmed to do that. And so, I mean, like, that also kind of explains why all these various misbegotten and all these things have been charmed by him. Even his sister, even, even Melania, who's, you know, the greatest warrior who's never known defeat is under his spell and has been charmed by him and has been manipulated and forced to do things. You know, and who knows if, who knows if America might not have been, that might not have happened too. Who who knows if America might not have been charmed into shattering the Elden Ring, Elden Ring to bring about all of this. Who knows if Ronnie might not have been charmed into killing Godwin and, and starting her whole thing by Mikola. You know, who says that Mikola might not have been behind everything to begin with, with all of this shit. I, you know, I guess there is that potential. Interesting though. Okay. Well, I do want to. I do want to buy, you know, both of these blades at least. I think there's another one with a bell over here. I think there's another one with a bell. It's up near the cave over here. I think this is the one with the bell. But yeah, I wanna I wanna see what both of these blades are and their attacks are and shit like that. I'm not necessarily worried about the spell because it requires 72 faith to be able to use. And then we'll go kill Radagon and the Elden Beast and in this playthrough, I guess. I can actually move on with my life. Holy shit, it's amazing. This might be one where you gotta get up from the above again. Yeah, I think it is. Isn't there a spirit jump? Yeah, I think you need to get it close over here and then use the spirit jump to fucking get on it or something. I think, right? fucking come down here and check this one down here I think it has to be one of the ones with the bells but I already used the one on the fucking oh this one has a bell on it okay
I don't have enough in. So it's twin colossal swords, they're individual swords this time instead of a pair. That's pretty fucking cool. I'm not gonna lie, that's pretty fucking dope. Swarm and loot for delivery and downward slash speed of less attack and followed up by an additional light attack. Charge and increase power of the skill. Okay. And the follow up attack. Are these both dual sets? Interesting. I think that's better personally but i mean you can have both of them you know all right that's cool they're both you know that's, that's pretty dope that's pretty dope all right well yes let's uh i'll finish the game in this playthrough thinking about something i'm just i'm just curious go ahead and uh, I, I just want to see if anything's different in here right out there and it will be So I got the needle. I've already done the frenzied flame. I've done Ronnie's. I don't think I've done any. Well, I think I maybe I've done Fia's. I don't know. I just want to get this because if there are no other choices in here, there's nothing new. Then I'll go to what is it, Plastidusix's place or whatever. Yeah, the Dragon Lord's place. And, uh...
We'll re we'll use the needle to get a different ending here. So I still wonder what it is that America got impaled by here. Was it the Elden Beast herself that like did that? Nothing seemingly from Mesmer. Maybe Radagon. I don't know. Here the Elden Ring takes its form as the Elden Beast.
feels like he does more damage than he used to. Also made him move around a lot more since you can have torrent in here now. Oh god, I guess I should fucking look and pay attention more. I'll stay locked on locked on though. I couldn't see because I'm running away from that fucking stupid Elden Star shit. Alright, but at least now we should be able to get in here and buff before this shit starts. Oh, fuck it, we'll run out fucking... We'll do a will this shit. We'll do the madness and the fire.
there it is. And there it is. The game is beaten. It is done. to Sid Sax's place. And there it is. It purged the frenzied flame. We are no longer crazy. Fractured America. We have Ronnie's, which I have done. Is there no way to like choose what rune we want to use. I'm just seeing if there's any, like, I don't think there is, right? There's just summon Ronnie. Okay. Okay, here we go. And the Elden Rune, use the Perfect Order, Death Prince, Fell Curse. I think I've done Death Prince. Do the Perfect Order. I'm just doing these for achievements, really. I've... I've seen all the endings. The Chaos ending and Ronnie's ending, I think, are the two probably canon endings. With subsequent playthroughs, I might do different endings and upload those to just have all endings at the, uh, you know, tied with my playthroughs here. So this is what's kind of like weird about this is like now we're Elden Lord and consort to America, but America is essentially dead. You know, she's just a, a husk that the is leaves tell a story of how a tarnished became Elden Lord in our home across the fog. The lands between. Our seed will look back upon us and recall. The age of order. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the thing is like America is essentially dead. He's just a husk that is the vessel for the Elden Ring, you know, so like kind of a shitty ending, you know, there's there's nothing else at the beginning. No, I don't want to start journey too. So, I mean, there we go. Um, I've kind of already talked about my opinions of things, but I'll go ahead and kind of rehash things again. Um, pretty much everything about the DLC other than the boss fights, I really, really enjoyed. It really felt like the, it felt like going like the Elden Ring base game was like, you know, 
the realm of the mortals and that's you know that that area is kind of like dealing more with like npc and mortal issues and things like that and again you know you're tarnished whatever, whatever. And then the shadow realm the dlc felt like okay we're entering into the realm of the gods that's what it felt like to me it felt like more the the, the all the, the 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 areas felt more ethereal felt more spiritual i guess if you want to say that uh and yeah it felt more i guess divine you know especially the 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 last area climbing up through to the gate of divinity uh to fight radon that area and then the the rua runes whatever they're called that area felt very you know kind of what i would expect for like the the uh like mount olympus that's what i would expect that shit to look like so like the everything felt very kind of like ethereal and otherworldly and essentially yeah like you're in the realm of the gods and you're dealing with god stuff um the npcs really in this one i mean I, I lost track of them I, I, throughout, you know, like, I don't know if they're, I, I would assume there's more to do with some of those NPCs again and follow up playthroughs. I guess I'll find out. Uh, I obviously I did things kind of out of order because I wanted to go and explore stuff. I think technically by following like Nicholas crosses, you're supposed to like, that's how it's supposed to, you know, show you how you're supposed to go do things in order uh that they want you to to like follow the story anyway but um like the theolier and einsbach i guess are the only npc quest lines that i finished you know einsbach we talked to him and he basically tells you about you know he was a servant of moog moog was manipulated and used by mikola uh the whole time the kidnapping was part of mikola's plan etc uh he wanted us to kill moog and use his body uh or and soul and maroon or whatever to bring back radagon blah 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 blah. um theolier you know that saint trina's thing oh which that actually i wanted to to look at that uh, i wanted to go and look and see if there's any more dialogue here with saint trina let's go talk to her but uh you know her his quest line brought us down here this boss fight in here i thought was very annoying um but basically it just came down to you know St. Trina talks to us and not him, and that's basically what his quest line was. Oh shit, what is this? St. Trina's Blossom. Oh, she's dead too. I guess she was still tied to him, even though not. St. Trina's life wreathed and fell, as fleeting as seasons at her last. She left a single water lily, slightly boost max FP. Despite the velvety purple hue, the flower is in no way poisonous. It merely blooms in... Quietude. Huh. The power of the, this was the vassal beast of the greater will and living inca incarnation of the concept of order. Is that a, uh, a talisman? What is it? What is it? Is it a weapon of some sort? Oh, little flower you put in your ear. Or St. Trina. Yeah, so I'll do this max FP. Huh. Um. Yeah, I can't, I don't know. I, I feel like. I feel like there's still more. I feel like there should still be more. Like St. Trina story. Basically, she was just the other half of Mikola that he discarded on his way. And then she, we just hear a couple of lines of dialogue from her. Uh, and, and then Theolia's quest line. And now that we've killed Mikola, we've got that. Like, that's all, that's all there is to St. Trina. She's not another kind of boss. There's no 
There's nothing more about her that we learn at all. Uh, we don't get any more insights from, from her about Mikola, etc., etc. Like, it's just... You know, she's kind of, I guess, the embodiment of sleep, and she's basically telling us that, you know, we need to stop him. Becoming a god will be his prison, uh, etc., etc. But, you know, there's no more context beyond that. Um, and I feel like that's kind of a way with a lot of this stuff. There's a lot more, like, I don't know, character and lore stuff that we don't really know. We don't, like, I mean, Mikola was kind of the central thing of this, but, like, again... And, and I know that a lot of soul stuff really is very kind of left into interpretation. They give you just enough stuff to like speculate uh, and interpret, like, you know, how you want. Like this, for example, let, let, let's come up here. Let's go to America's home. You know what I mean? So, you know, this is something that I found probably the most interesting out of this. I found this area to be the most interesting thing out of this whole DLC for me. Because it, it sheds a lot more light, potentially, on uh, America uh, and the reason why uh, she did a lot of things that she did. Am I going the wrong way? No. I'm up here and get over here, right? And I mean, I, I went here during my playthrough, obviously. Yeah, this this is just called the Shaman Village. And it looks just like a small little humble village. There's flowers everywhere, it's beautiful. You know, and right here where this tree was, this is, I guess is a minor herd tree of sorts. We find an incantation. See if I can find it. Here it is. Minor Erd Tree Incantation. Continuously heals allies in the area. 70 Faith. Secret Incantation of Queen America. The only kindness of gold without order. Creates a small illusory tree that continuously restores the HP of nearby alleys. America bathes the village of her home in gold, knowing full well that there is no one to heal. And then on top of that, we get a talisman from her that protects us from holy damage, which reads, we can find it here. Lose soul and damage negation by the utmost. What was her prayer, her wish, her confession? There's no one left to answer. America never returned home again. So, who knows what exactly it was. Maybe she wasn't here. Maybe she was. But her home seemingly was attacked. And the people that... Uh, this is just my interpretation of that reading. Something happened here and, and her people were wiped out. Maybe they were attacked by uh, other people. Who knows what the case would be. Maybe it was something to do with the god from the previous order. Uh, that affected them. And so, like, this seems to be her body. This is where we find that talisman. This potentially might be the actual physical body of America here in this tree. This might be where she committed herself and she, like, you know, discarded her body to become a god. But it would make sense as to why, then, all the things she did was to essentially create an order where she would never lose people again. And then once Godwin was taken from her, her son, uh, she tried to destroy the Elden Ring, which in turn would have killed her. Now, potentially, also, with everything going on with Mikola and his manipulations, it could be that Mikola, you know, you know, manipulated her into doing that and also manipulated and, and all these things. And maybe that's also potentially why she wanted to shatter the Elden Ring, too, is, you know, she wanted to destroy the entire cycle, make it so that no one could become a god. And in, in, in a certain kind of sense, that would make sense. You know, if Mikola manipulated the events to get rid of Godwin and kill him so that he could become a god and, and create his age of compassion 
Perhaps she, in a fit of rage, decided, that's it. I'm going to destroy the Elden Ring and be done with it. Uh, I don't want, you know, destroy all the cycles, remove remove everything, etc., etc. Who knows? But I found that this is the, probably the most interesting thing out of the DLC. It gives us more insight to America and potentially her actions. Um... But other than that, I mean, a lot of areas, like this whole area, there's really nothing in it. This area, there's nothing in it. This Abyssal Wood area, there's really nothing in it. There's just this one little area that I think it took me maybe 20 minutes to get through, 20, 30 minutes to maybe to get through this whole thing, and then another maybe 30 minutes to an hour to beat the boss. Like, I don't know. This whole Abyssal Woods area, I was extremely disappointed in. This whole area is, you know, an area of madness. You know, uh, there should have been, I feel like, other creatures in here infected with madness. Uh, maybe maybe a lot of, you know, potential NPC invaders happening in here. Or just an area in general where the rules of invasion are different. And you can be invaded by uh, people who are of the, the Frenzied Flame, you know? People who are uh, have done the Frenzied Flame storyline. You know, if you're in here... You can be invaded by them, whether you've done the Flimsy Flight storyline or not, like, and, and whether or not you had, like, I just, it would make more sense. And it would make the, like, the area thematically, the way it looked, it was very spooky. It was very kind of, you know, horror themed, kind of Silent Hill themed with the fog and the quiet and everything. But there's just goats and rats and occasionally, like, inquisitors and then those fucking eye things. And, like, I don't know. I was extremely disappointed in this area. Uh, I was extremely disappointed in the finger areas. Again, there's nothing there. There's no real lore or anything more to learn about the fingers. Um, and that led to a quest line where we, we fought the mother of fingers, the first finger that was sent down here, and uh, where we... Um, let's see if I can find the remembrance. The nerd key items. Uh, the power of its name segment blah, blah, blah. the mother of all two fingers and finger creepers was in turn a magnificently gleamed daughter of the greater will with the first shooting star and the first shooting star to fall upon lands between I guess I need to read her item descriptions there's something in her item descriptions about how uh, you know the greater will eventually she lost communication with the greater will and had never been able to get there and has been waiting for more communication from the greater will since so like that's the only real lore we got about that from the fingers. Like, she was the first finger, all fingers came from her, or the greater will eventually cut ties from her for whatever reason. We don't get any more, you know? Maybe the, and, and again, I, I'm sure there's still more stuff in the DLC that I haven't done. There's still, I'm sure, more more things to do, more items to get in descriptions that will paint a, a bigger picture. So, this is just going off of what I know right now. But, I mean, yeah. Area unused, area really unused, area unused, and this is a big chunk. You know, like, that's like uh, close to uh, like maybe 15 to 20 percent somewhere in there of like area that's not really used for anything. Um, this area, too, really, there wasn't a whole lot here. There was a couple of like dragons running around, but otherwise there's really not much here. You know what I mean? There's a couple of the drakes, there's one ancient dragon, and then there's Bale. There's really nothing else around here at all. So, I mean, like, if you like this whole area going down here pretty much unused the red coast area right here as well there's really nothing here there's like a, a bunch of undead stuff but otherwise there's really nothing to find here unless you're uh getting more glove wart stuff for like spirit summons and whatever and uh, the, the the spirit ashes the blue area here was cool and i mean that led down to the whole area with uh saint Trina, etc and this is one of the more beautiful areas in the game the the blue cerulean coast um, but so yeah, like this it, like there's just there's stuff that feels unfinished It feels like this area is unfinished. It feels like this is unfinished. It feels like this is unfinished it feels like this is unfinished it feels like this is unfinished and I mean We're not getting any more DLC according to Miyazaki So the only potential thing you could hope for is in future patches. They might add more stuff as they go along I don't 100% remember I could be very much incorrect about this, but I swear Jarberg 
and a couple of the NPC like quest lines were not in the game until they were patched later on. They weren't in the game on release and they were patched in la later on. Maybe I'm mistaken about that. I could be very wrong. So I don't know. I, I guess it's always a possibility, but generally speaking with FromSoft games, that's not the case. Like once it's out, it's done. That's it. The only thing you get is like DLC stuff. So, I mean, it feels like there's areas that are unfinished and unused, unused potential. Um, and like the boss fights, I don't know, for the most part, I really care for the most of the boss fights. I mean, again, I'm going to go through the DLC again with a new character, different build and try some different things, try some of the new weapons, etc. But for the most part, like most of the boss fights really were just like the, they expect you to just burst them down, it seemed like. You either need to be super tanky and face tank and like guard counter guard counters seem to really be something they want you to use in this. There's a lot of weapons and shields that enhance guard counters or that have special abilities based on doing a guard counter, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it really feels like they want you to use guard counters more in this uh, and, and really emphasize using shields more in this. And with this build that I had, I didn't want to use shield really just wanted to be kind of a hybrid caster you know frenzy flame person the frenzy flame incantations really weren't anything that i cared about so the build in general i i, I guess I, I just ended up being essentially a pyro character you know just throwing fireballs and using the blasphemous blade but it is what it is so but made it through it anyway so i mean honestly i i think like i, I enjoyed mesmer i thought mesmer was a challenging but fair boss fight like I said uh, before, his timings on his, um, the the timings on his attacks were easy. Not necessarily. There, there. You could you could learn them and do things in between them. Essentially, like he had a lot of mix ups and he had a lot of like different you know delays and times and stuff like that. But there were things that were readable and you could use you could get used to and you could find windows to get attacks in and do things. His super, you know, attacks that did a shit ton of damage that led into AOEs. Uh, you could learn to dodge a lot of those. His grab, you could learn to dodge a lot. Of, you know, all of his stuff was was like punishing if you made a mistake, but it was still easy enough for you to like dodge and punish him when you, you know, dodged it. You got rewarded for doing what you're supposed to in that fight. <clears throat> um, the fucking porcupine hippo at the the beginning of the shadow keep i hated that boss fight that was stupid this giant the, the small arena uh, it felt like the bull again and and sekiro when you're going into the sheena castle like the small fucking area with this giant creature that has these giant hitboxes it's relentless it's running around everywhere it's hard to fucking get to and hit and when you're trying to get up to it and hit it it's already starting a new attack so you got to dodge it and then in its second phase, it's got all these fucking stupid AOE things where it's throwing its spines everywhere. It was dumb and annoying, but, you know, got through that. The the, the Putrid Knight or whatever before St. Trina, kind of the same. It, had, it really just did, like, one or two kind of attack chains, and then you just needed to avoid its, like, AOE ghost fire shit. It was kind of annoying, and every time... The, the big thing, and I, I can understand it to a degree, is, like... Whenever you heal, whenever you see a window to try to heal, the bosses would always like immediately aggro on you and throw out some kind of attack uh, to prevent you from healing and or essentially negate the heal that you just had. So it's like most of the boss fights were basically don't plan on not healing. Just just face tank them, break their stance, get your visceral attack in. And in that window, that's when you can heal. And that's pretty much what the boss fights felt to me. And that's kind of really how I went through this game of the character um and then you know like the last fight with the dom is just it's just ridiculous like it was i mean i don't know the exact time i would have to look at it but i want to say somewhere between like eight and nine hours it took me to actually beat him i know i spent at least six or seven hours yesterday and then probably uh, another hour or two today um you know fighting him and again, it, it came down to exactly what I said when I was fighting. It just came down to good, perfect RNG. And that's what it did. It came down to RNG where he wasn't doing uh, a lot of AOE spammy stuff. I dodged one of his attacks. I got a bunch of jump attacks in where he wasn't knocking me out of the air. Uh, and I broke his stance. And then I just was able to follow up. 
you know, attacks and kill them. And that and that's what it came down to. That's just what it came down to. You know, the previous fight, I had him low and I probably could have killed him again. But then he did his gravity attack that sucked me in. And, you know, there's seemingly no way to avoid it. It seems like it's one of the, it's a situation where you're supposed to have a shield and you're just supposed to fucking tank it. And I don't have that with this character, so I just die, you know, and I, 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 I as I've said before, you know, I, I don't know how I'm going to do some of the, of the the uploading of some of this because of how long it took me to beat Radon. Uh, part of me wants to just kind of cut it down a little bit so that you guys just kind of see the ending and then I'll leave it, you know, uh, I, I, I'll probably just put some like maybe some text up on the screen and just say, hey, you know, if you guys really want to see the full nine hours of me bashing my head against this wall, let me know in the comments and, you know, I'll upload the rest of those videos, you know, later so you can watch it if you want to. Otherwise, I don't necessarily want to waste your time and I'll just have, you know, maybe some of my good attempts in there and then eventually the 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 final, you know, fight. Um, but to me that fight is not an enjoyable fight at all it's literally you have to do everything perfect or it feels like several things it feels like either a you have to have a specific kind of build to beat him in a specific way the game intends you to play it whether that's you know face tanking with shields or having some kind of super status effect build uh that bursts him down incredibly fast so he doesn't really necessarily get a chance to get his stupid chain attacks off Otherwise, if you're going to play the game the way that I basically just played that you have to like pixel perfect dodge his shit. Otherwise, you get stuck in a lot of his chain attacks and you just die. And God forbid he does some of his, you know, AOE shit that you get stuck in. There's nothing for you to do. So, I mean, again, the, the Redon fight just came down to eventually our good RNG and I killed him and it just took me nine hours to get there. The first phase I really liked. The first phase with the Dawn was awesome. You know, if, if the fight was more of that and then it ramped up a little bit more in the second phase. The, the main thing with the second phase is just the follow up AOE fucking bullshit attacks that he has after he swings everything. And, and like, it's just dumb. It's just dumb. It, it, it's literally 100% designed to roll catch you. And it's just made to where you have to do it perfectly. Otherwise, you're fucked. So I and, and I don't enjoy that. And like I said, it like whatever FromSoft's next game is, I'm, I'm sure I will check it out and buy it. But that will be an indication for me uh, as to whether or not I'm going to keep getting these games moving forward. Uh, and I guess it depends on the type of game of it is. But if they're doing another kind of like Dark Fantasy, Dark Souls, Elden Ring like game where it's basically kind of this in a new setting with uh, some different combat updates and et cetera, et cetera. And if the bosses moving forward are this style of kind of boss where the builds that I like to play and use, I have to be like pixel perfect, et cetera, et cetera. Or, you know, that's not for me. I don't like those kind of challenges. I don't I don't want to sit here and essentially try to like no hit run the boss or just wait till I get the perfect RNG to beat the boss. That to me isn't fun. And really, the majority of the boss fights in the DLC they were frustrating and some of some of them I didn't really have fun with at all. Some of it that I enjoyed, but most of them I just found annoying. Most of them I just really found annoying. Uh, and then in particular, Radon's fight, I didn't like like the the dancing line boss. I thought that was cool. That was a good fight. I, I think I only took like two or three attempts to beat him. It didn't take me very long to beat him. Um, Mesmer fight. I really like Mesmer fight. Uh, Rolana's fight, I, I, I think it's a cool fight, but at the same time, like, she has stupid long combo chains, man, you know, and she doesn't necessarily do a ton of damage, so, like, you can kind of tank some of those, and there's windows to heal in there, but again, it's another fight where, like, you're just waiting for her to finish her combo so that you can get in a hit in, you know, and that, to me, gets boring after a while, just sitting here, dodge rolling, dodge rolling, dodge rolling, dodge rolling, hit, dodge rolling, dodge rolling, dodge rolling, you know, 90% of the fight, I'm just rolling around avoiding stuff. And then the other 10% of the fight, I get one hit in between her combos. That that gets kind of boring. Um, let's see. Like, like I said, the hippo porcupine one was stupid. I thought the frenzied flame boss was going to be harder. But honestly, I, I think it only took me maybe like a half hour, 45 minutes uh, of 
learning his stuff to beat him. Uh, it was an okay fight. Um, I was also very disappointed that there was no more, like, frenzied stuff, really. Basically, we got one more frenzied incantation from the boss and then uh, the great sword from him. I think there's also a great spear that does frenzy stuff that you get from the Inquisitor. Uh, but uh, and then there's a glove. There's like a fifth glove weapon that does frenzy build up. Um, there's like a grenade that does frenzy flame stuff. And then there's a torch that does frenzied stuff. But like. There's nothing really interesting. I wanted more spells, more interesting weapons to do frenzied stuff more more like gear armor sets that were based around frenzied stuff i don't know i wanted them to expand more on the frenzied flame stuff and that i could just you know that's just me wanting more of that and that lower knowledge but like yeah so i was disappointed in that um there weren't really a whole lot of more or like magic in general seems like they didn't really expand on that a lot more in this um there's a handful of spells that I found and a handful of incantations. Most of the incantations were like Mesmer stuff, the, the Serpent Fire, uh, the Rain of Fire, and a couple of those things in Mesmer's, you know, like jump in AOE fireball. Um, you know, they're okay. They didn't really do anything to wow me. They're, they weren't really anything better than the Giant's Flame Take the Fireball that just destroys everything. Um... So, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know what I would really rate the DLC yet. Like I said, I want to play through it a few more times with a couple of different um, classes. Whatever, whatever. Do a couple of different builds, I guess. Not classes, but just want to try different, some different builds and just see how the DLC, DLC feels with other builds. Um, as far as, like, art and, uh, and aesthetic in the field of this DLC, I would probably give that, like, a 9 out of 10 boss fights overall probably like a seven out of ten maybe um new gear there's a lot of new weapons in the game uh most of those i haven't really tried because they didn't really fit my character um but it's good to see a lot of new gear and armor and weapons that seem interesting um mesmer's great spear seems cool but I don't know. I think they nerfed the Grave Spear like attack speed. It seems really slow now. So, like, that's really why I didn't use it. Um, otherwise, I would have used Mesmer's Spear. So, I don't know. I guess maybe overall, you know, I would rate this DLC maybe like, I don't know. It's, like I said, it's hard to give it an overall rating until I try some other builds and some things. I don't know. Maybe like a 7.5 to an 8. Which is pretty much what I really give the base game of Elden Ring, like uh, a seven and a half to an eight. Like the game has a lot to do in it, but I don't know. Like the stuff to do is very meaningful. Like the world of Elden Ring, it just feels like I I don't know how well the open world fits the Dark Souls formula in this iteration. Um, like the world feels like dead. It feels like there's just a lot of stuff to explore for the sake of exploring that isn't necessarily really meaningful. There's a ton of items and stuff that you get that are just mostly for crafting stuff, which doesn't necessarily always seem usable. Like I, I'm not a person that really uses pots and throwing knives and all these things and builds. Like maybe that has more PVP oriented stuff, but Again, I'm not quite so PvP centric in these games. Um, so I don't know. And the the wet the 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 ashes of, of war in, in Elden Ring, they're definitely cool and they, they give you a lot of variety and stuff, but it also becomes kind of a crutch where it's like, okay, let me just spam L2. Let me just keep spamming the, the weapon ash and Again, for me, I, I prefer kind of the more Bloodborne and Sekiro style of like gameplay. I like kind of something that's more mechanically skillful and engaging. You know, the, the whole Bloodborne rally system where there's a certain segment of your health that gets grayed out and you can get back if you become if you be aggressive and, and do damage. Um, the how the the visceral attacks work where you know if you time your gunshot right you can stun them and then get a visceral attack in and you know it's 
it's something that uh is rewarding but also punishing or if you don't do it right like the guns don't do a lot of damage so if you miss time and you don't do it right you're gonna get hit and you're gonna get punished uh the dodging and dashing around feels better it's not rolling it's natural like you're zipping around you know the battlefield the 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 fights against the other hunters in bloodborne are in my opinion the best fights in the game i love those fights and i would like to see more of it i don't know like i i just to me bloodborne is still their absolute masterpiece like bloodborne is the closest 10 out of 10 game that i've played in a long time and i like i i give bloodborne like a 9 out of 10 or a 9.8 out of 10 is what i meant like bloodborne is the closest to like a perfect game like 10 out of 10 for me is unachievable because it's like everything's absolutely perfect um, the only thing that really would improve, improve Bloodborne is, you know, an update to 60 FPS so I can play it on like either my PS5 or my PC and not, you know, on a PS4 or 30 FPS and 1080p. You know what I mean? Um, that would probably make that game 10 out of 10. Uh, and then there's Sekiro. Like, you know, Sekiro's a lot, a lot of combat is similar in Sekiro, but it's also different because there's literally only one weapon. So they kind of built the mechanics around you only having one weapon, um, but it's still mechanically skillful and, and engaging. It becomes kind of this chess, you know, tug of war game against the AI where there's, you know, back and forth with the attacking and defending and depending on of the timings with your block, you get different sounds and that can indicate the AI is going to do different attacks. And then you can manipulate the AI into doing specific attacks that you expect so that you can block them and set up for other things. And like you can, once you really understand the combat and secure and get into it, you can like get like, you, you can plan several steps ahead of what the AI is going to do and, and, you know, be prepared for it. And I don't know. I just like, I would love to see a lot of the, 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 the concepts from Bloodborne and Sekiro put into combat mixed with Dark Souls, you know, the better dashing around the, um, you know, they kind of have a stance system in this, but it's not really the same. You know, it's more of an, an invisible meter that you just hit them a, a certain amount of times when you break them, then you get, you know, a visceral attack in. But I would like to see, you know, uh, a similar thing in Sekiro where, you know, the blocking with your weapons can can do things and instead of just like a guard counter like if you perfect block something it can stagger them and leave them vulnerable or you know break their stance or whatever man i don't know i don't know but it is what it is like i said i, I would probably give from my experience overall with this probably somewhere between like a seven and a half maybe an eight for the dlc and elden ring like it's probably around seven and a half to eight somewhere in there probably any more towards an eight out of ten uh i think overall honestly i like dark souls 3 better as far as a souls game uh i i think just the the linear nature uh, of those games and the level design uh and it, it makes the discovery of things feel more meaningful it makes uh the weapons and stuff that you have and everything i think feel more meaningful um i don't know it, it just feels like there's a lot of empty and meaningless stuff that you find in elden ring and compared to other souls games and so moving forward hopefully that's something to do and i also really hope that moving forward they make the world feel more alive like i get the idea that Elden Ring and the lands between were in this kind of stagnant world where nothing has changed. You know, the the shattering has happened, this great war, no lords have been claimed. Uh the 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 the, the children of America haven't been able to claim the great runes to become the new Elden Lord and create the new order, new age, so it's up to us, and that's what we're trying to do. But there's also like there's gotta still be regular people living. You know, I mean there's plenty of tarnished NPCs around. Who's to say there aren't, you know, tarnished villages around with like live people and people like that would be going about their normal lives and trading and doing things like I want to see stuff like that in, in a game like this. Like I, I basically and this might this might just be like not the kind of game that from wants to make. And that's fine if that's the case. But for what I really want to see out of a game, I really want to see them take a setting like this this dark fantasy setting and the combat 
and the magic and everything like everything as far as that goes and then blend that together with a world like skyrim that feels alive and there's there's stuff to explore and there's like real people like seemingly to talk to you know real npc people to talk to and characters and you know i don't know just f make the world feel more alive and fleshed out and and have more meaning you know i guess to it i don't know i don't know but anyway i, I guess that's my two thoughts i could ramble on for a lot more longer but i've been doing enough um so that's that's the playthrough of this um i guess i'll probably do a more thorough uh review of the dlc after i've gone through and maybe done another playthrough or two with some different characters and i'll do a more thorough review and give my opinions on on things after i've tried doing things and maybe it'll change maybe my rating will change maybe there's uh more things to this that i need to discover and understand uh to make the combat more manageable meaningful you know whatever you want to say etc so but anyway guys thank you for watching i appreciate it i hope you enjoyed the playthrough uh, i'll get this up on the youtube channel as soon as possible obviously if you're listening to this that'll have happened already and then um i'll probably at some point in time might even be before this this gets fully uploaded uh we'll do some streams trying out some other builds and things in this and we'll see what happens and where we go uh but uh i plan on doing a cyberpunk playthrough uh soon after this at some point and then uh we got space marine 2 coming out soon that i want to Hopefully that'll be good and that'll be something to get into. And I plan on doing my first playthrough Space Marine run sometime before that comes out. But anyway, thank you guys very much. Hope you enjoyed the playthrough. Uh, I apologize for a lot of the complaining I have at times. I'm passionate about these games, but it also uh, some of the things uh, gets frustrating and annoying. Um, but I mean, the game is an absolutely beautiful game artistically looking. I mean, look at this. Look at this gold flowing around. It's beautiful. There's music tied in with this. You know? So, thank you guys. Appreciate you. We'll see you uh, on the next one.